quick brief about Uma. Uh, Uma is currently the head of uh, Chaos Engineering at Harness. Earlier, Uma co-founded Chaos Native and Maya data companies where he co-created open source projects, Litmus Chaos and Open EBS. He's an active maintainer of the popular CNC of Chaos Engineering project, Litmus Chaos. Uh, he's a regular speaker on the subject of Chaos Engineering and Cloud Native DevOps. And also, he's a regular speaker in meetups, conferences, which are related to SRE, reliability, and Chaos Engineering. Uma holds a master's degree in telecommunications and software engineering from Illinois Institute of Technology, Chicago, and also a bachelor's in communication from SV University. Uh, thanks a lot, Uma, for being here. The stage is all yours. Everyone, good morning. Great to see this uh, events coming back to the in-person form, right? So um, I've been missing them for a few years, right? Uh, also got fixed to the seat, delivering talks uh, into the laptop. Now, it's, it's good to see some real questions coming up. Um, thanks, Sindhil, uh, not only for inviting the organizers. It's, it's a big job to uh, do events like this. They have to go run around uh, permissions, uh, you know, find speakers, organizing events is not easy. Um, so. Congratulations on running such a big event, uh, first of all. And thank you for taking time and coming here to learn a little bit more. Um, today, I just want to, uh, I, I thought of spending some, some time technically on uh, deep into chaos engineering, but then I saw one more talk on Litmus Chaos by Atul later this evening. So I'll probably stick to some of the good practices and why you need to do chaos engineering, right? So. Uh, with that, um, let's start. Um, so reliability is is a not a new topic. It's been there for quite some time, right? So people talked about uh, four nines, five nines, reliability, and all. But um, it's become more important for various reasons um, in the recent times. Uh, there's too much digitalization. Everybody is on phones doing business, so we get frustrated if something doesn't work, right? So the customer expectation is really, really high nowadays. Um, uh, even people who don't know anything to do with computers, they want phone pay to happen just like that, right? So you have a smartphone, and I want to transfer money or receive money, pay money, it should just happen. Otherwise, you start scolding somebody who's providing the whole technology suite, right? So that's the kind of expectation of reliability. So who provides that reliability is a big question, right? Um, and how to do it right, right? So just a little bit about me. I uh, work at Harness, head of chaos engineering there. Uh, I co-founded uh, uh, three companies. The last one was uh, um, Chaos Native, uh, where uh, I was doing uh, chaos engineering using Litmus which I wrote, co-founded uh, about uh, six years ago now. It's a CNCF hosted uh, project now. It's an incubating, probably going to graduation sometime next year. There's a lot of um, users uh, with the Litmus, probably in uh, thousands. We are pulling about uh, a million downloads, uh, uh, Docker pulls um, a month. Uh, so that's, that's great to see. Um, it, it all happened uh, because Kubernetes um, has seen a great uh, adoption curve, right? So there's no um, no question of why Kubernetes now, right? So you, things are just moving around uh, with the flow. So let me talk about uh, the reliability a little bit more uh, and then who should do the reliability and DevOps. There's a um, misconception that reliability should be given by SREs and reliability should be given by, um, they manage reliability. Uh, they are the ones that take care of if something goes down, and they are the ones who get fired if something doesn't work. All that is is fine, but it's not just SREs uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, are responsible for reliability. It's really uh, the code and uh, developers, right? So you need to work in tandem. Reliability has to be done uh, in, in DevOps itself, right? So um, 
so today's challenges in DevOps, right? Everybody wants to move to Kubernetes. The sales pitch for Kubernetes is, why are you waiting for six months to deliver a change? Put hundreds of millions of dollars, increase customer satisfaction, you think of a change, you deliver next week or next month, right? So that's the change uh, that's happening. The pitch for moving to Kubernetes is accelerating the change delivery or deliver the change to the end user as quick as possible, right? No more uh, once in six months upgrades and all, right? Um, speed is a challenge, and then there are a lot of good practices that have come, right? And um, that, that's also the driving factor for all this innovation, right? If you see any container pitch, a why cloud native pitch, the real guys, um, the CIOs, CTOs of big banks or retail industries, why are they spending hundreds of millions of dollars per year project going into cloud native? Is really that you know customer expectations have changed. We cannot deliver our change slowly. We had to you know deliver it fast before uh, my competitor takes away my user, right? So speed is definitely a challenge, and uh, we're doing it, right? Most of uh, people are doing it. And while you do the change uh, super fast, uh, quality is a problem. Everybody is saying that, yeah, you know, move into containers, you don't need to worry about other person. Just write that process into a container, give nice APIs, deliver it, go home. It runs anywhere, that's fine. But does it run properly, right? Who takes care of that uh, QA testing? Uh, so it's a headache for QA guys, right? So um, the software spec will come in one way. Um, that's just this is what container does. So managing the quality has been an issue in microservices uh, in a paradigm, right? So that's, that's definitely a challenge. And um, because that is a challenge, um, developers are getting pulled into fixing issues more often, right? So you deliver fast. It goes to the next pipeline, and then you know it doesn't move faster again, right? So developers, again, there are a lot of tools that are coming to measure the developer productivity. Uh, where are you spending time? Writing code or fixing bugs, right? What bugs? Bugs found in pipelines immediately, or bugs found by SREs or customers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So developer productivity is is a big challenge today. For you know, I I. I made a decision to invest a lot of money, but where is all this money being, you know, uh, going? It's into developers, right? So developer cost is a trillion dollar um, uh, number today, right, all over the world. So are we spending uh, real uh, money into that? Cloud cost, right? So you see anybody who is in, in, on the cloud, how much percentage of it is for actually running the service versus how much is it for development and other things? It's 30% production, 70% testing and other things. What are these developers doing? Not only the salary, but you know they keep doing this testing 100 times, you know, you're increasing the cost. So developers' productivity is super important uh, to make a, a reasonable uh, ROI into all of this, right? So you, you're trying to push things fast. Um, there is somebody facing the heat for quality, Somebody is trying to say that you need to be very productive, you know, try some magic, and then still push it out faster, right? Uh, I want you to be really productive at the same time fast, making it quality. Either that guy is a magician or he leaves the company for another hike in another company. And then do the same thing again, right? So the main problem in all this big push is um, nobody is talking about uh, reliability, right? Reliability is a problem because you put in some wrong code or wrong configuration. And wrong configuration is again a SRE problem, may not be. You have not provided the right way to put the configuration. So it could be a developer problem, design issue, right? If you have nice design, SREs can use those parameters to automate some things or you know, do something uh, about uh, uh, you know, configuring them right. 
So developers need to think about the end service goals, not just like, you know, how my service talks to uh, next service and how to be interoperable. How can it be reliable, right? So there is not enough focus on, on reliability, right? So is reliability um, a goal, right? So that's what I'm trying to push the point here. Uh, developers definitely should think of um, how this eventually will run as a service and how will it be reliable. Because if you want to be really productive, you don't want to be debugging it, uh, you know, be on the calls with SREs, you know, lots of time. It should just run, right? And even if they find some issue, it should be fixed by um, SREs because there is good enough configuration parameters that are available. I don't need to be involved, right? Me as a developer, right? So that if you're being on calls all the time, or 50% of the time, you're being a critical engineer, not everybody gets con called on to the calls, right? Only if you're very good, you know everything, um, you'll be called on to the calls because, you know, there is an SLA. You had to solve it very quick. Otherwise, you know, the pressure is going to be mounted even further, right? So if you are such a good engineer, you should be writing code, not spend time with SREs. Right? So you should be designing it a little bit um, better, find issues in the design and keep improving it. Right? Yes, it is a goal. Um, reliability is a goal for good engineers. Right? So spend time in designing it in that aspect. Right? So it's like, you know, you're really leaking this code issues, uh, uh, design issues, architectural issues, you're leaking them onto the production. Uh, sometime it has to be found, right? If not now, maybe, you know, you just moved on, some other person comes six months later and his head will be on the anvil, right? Because, you know, the design bug that you put is not even known, right? So somebody has to put a retaining wall for this leaks in DevOps, right? And that's, that's a big trend that's, that's coming and the new trend that we are seeing is continuous resilience, right? Continuous integration, how to put the code. Continuous delivery, how to deliver the code. Man, all that's a good. Now the headache is, you know, we are on cloud native. Customers are there using it, right? My money is now going through microservices. Earlier it is mine friends, who, who the hell cares, right? So it's just that it's not going through now, right? So the pressure is more, and then you know, we have um, hundreds of millions of people doing these transactions, right, um, on a daily basis, and they have serious high expectation. So it has to be um, not debugged, it has to be fixed um, from leaking on to the next stage, right? And um, I was seeing changes taking uh, six months to three months, now, in our own organization, we do multiple builds in a day, whether we do multiple deployments, that sometimes yes, sometimes no, right? But things are happening very, very fast, right? So when you do that fast deployments, changes, you have to do that resilience thing also. So continuous resilience is a topic. Uh, that's uh, the innovation trigger now. I'll, I'll talk about it in a bit, right? So how to retain this reliability is the bigger question that we need to ask. Reliability of what, right? It's not about code, right? If you think about the code, my code has to be reliable, then, you know, there's code coverage and there is memory uh, leaks happening or not, um, you know, all these nice tools uh, to make sure that your code is nice, clean, intended, um, everything. But we have to think differently as developers, uh, right? Reliability of what? Uh, against what? Yeah, it is reliable, it's running. I just tested, but you know, after six months, there is an outage, right? Against what, and uh, how to measure it, right? Measure it. People generally call it as uh, five nines, six nines, so many hours of uh, downtime only. I'm a developer. What are these numbers, right? You are saying developers need to take care of reliability, but tell me how to actually give me a number. Uh, how to how do I measure? I'm saying my code is reliable, tell me I'm wrong, right? So these are the problems that we have to see, right? So you need to have um, right um, angles to measure reliability of business services, 
uh, or deployed services reliability against um, some failure, right? Outage is something that is seen by your end user, right? And outage happens, you know, let's say in a finance, somebody talked about, I think, uh, Krishna, uh, only a few hours in a year. That's the number that you've seen. But alerts are happening all the time, right? That means something failed, but still you're, you're not resulted in outage, right? So when this uh, falls happen, sometimes it results in an outage, right? So you need to, um, you need to be reliable against these faults, right? And why are we talking about uh, this reliability of Kubernetes cloud native services? That's because um, Kubernetes has an architecture where it induces faults all the time on its own. And people say it's a very good design, yeah? Pod delete, that is the main fault that happens. You know, if you go back to one more virtualization era, it's a VM delete. How often does a VM delete happens, right? And if you go back even further, right, how often does a node um, is removed or rebooted? People used to celebrate, yeah, you know, there was one server, it was not rebooted for one year, continuously serving come to Kubernetes, yeah, it just, you know, moved from here to there all the time because of some configuration. We work on the concept of reconciliation, right? Kubernetes, there is an expectation. It has to come to that state, even if somebody gets deleted. In fact, what I do is I go delete it because I think it should run on the other node, right? So it's all given as an architecture advantage. It's actually a fault that your architecture is inducing. So the service has to be reliable, and Kubernetes doesn't guarantee that. The developer has to make sure, right? Uh, it has to be reliable. So it's, it's really a burden on the developers to make sure that the reliability angle is, is put into their head, right? So <clears throat> um, if I had to summarize, um, how do you measure the reliability is things are happening and some faults are also happening and my steady state checks when I keep measuring the five or 10 or hundreds of monitors, they're all serving as expected, right? So, and the key thing here is you should expect faults to happen, right? What are the types of faults? Pod delete is one thing. But then um, you go to AWS, yeah, you know, I give SLAs, right? For what? For downtimes. Do you give SLAs for latencies? Yeah, I give, you know, generally I give the latencies too, but sometimes they go a little bit, you know, on the spike latency. And latency here, latency there, everything gets piled up, you know, four or five, then because of that latency issue, transactions get loaded up, and that adds load onto some other node, pod gets deleted, moved, finally some SRA gets called, outages happen, right? So this is, this is what's happening. So steady state checks need to be really, really um, measured, very, even if it's latency increase, it is a fault, not only pod delete. Latency is increased by a service. I have not done anything. Some wire is cut in a ocean somewhere, and then you know, some small 10% latency is increased for one hour by the time the switch is rebooted or switch is you know, moved on to somewhere else. So latency is a problem. Uh, you should consider it as a fault, right? So how do you do all this you know, fault injection, steady state measurement, right? People are doing ops. SREs are doing or you know, all they're looking at is monitors continuously, how can I measure things better, right? That's, that's the job, they're doing it very well. But if you look at the reliability, you know, the journey till here, last four or five slides, what we're saying is you have to measure when faults are happening, right? So you don't need to break, one misconception about chaos engineering is break down one entire data center and then measure your things are working or not. No, that's not what is, that's one aspect of chaos engineering. 
chaos engineering is really about introduce controlled faults that are all that are happening all the time but are being ignored all the time also right and then try to measure uh, something that helps the developers to go and fix you know either design or code a 5% increase in latency should not eventually increase uh, the end uh, service latency should not be increased something something should be taken care May, maybe more provisioning or provisioning of certain resource should be happening etc cetera, etc cetera. developers you know each uh, service is unique they can take care of it so this is chaos engineering right so uh, measure the steady state while faults are happening uh, is called um, chaos uh, engineering right and because of the said reasons it is a natural choice chaos engineering has been there for a long time um, but now because of kubernetes microservices architecture and everybody is trying to push things much faster you don't have time for um, you know doing a, a proper testing right uh, earlier there there is a api change but now you know each api is coming through as a microservice right and before i know it um, a lot of containers got upgraded right to the next level so how do i go and test this change right not only in production in pre prod so you use chaos engineering as a way to it doesn't matter what changed my test case is same i go and introduce hundreds of faults that are possible and still my service is reliable what change happened who cares right any fault that happens it should be reliable right so that's what chaos engineering is right so you are taking an innovative approach how fast you change what changes you do doesn't matter i go based on my service angle right the service has 100 dependencies and 200 resources the 200 resources can inject 500 faults i will inject them and see whether things are working or not yesterday it was working all the steady states were good now a new build has come i'll do the same checks and see right so this is another uh, total different approach to making sure that you're not leaking bugs to the right side and nothing changes in chaos engineering the original definition um, remains same right introduce a fault and then uh, verify it is just that the people who are doing how frequently you have to do and why you need to do there are total different reasons right and where is chaos engineering being used today right so mostly you know uh, i've seen people taking up my litmus chaos code very aggressively by developers right so we are seeing million docker pulls a month but now i'm more towards you know i'm seeing a lot of enterprise deployments also financial services are using because they are moving to kubernetes right and they are doing good business right so they are a very good industry congrats uh, right so because you know there is everybody is on smartphone doing something about their money nowadays not just in india everywhere right so a lot of services are there so there is a lot of load and customer expectations have increased so almost all the banks either are now doing chaos engineering or will do chaos engineering in the next 2 3 years right who have been doing chaos engineering or very popular banks um, right so they are also again changing their strategy towards and chaos engineering so they are definitely doing and then dr scenarios right even if you go to rbi or any other federal regulations um they are trying to control how banks operate right so are you doing dr testing that's a regulation if you say no then we'll revoke your license okay and uh, they have to prove that they have done dr come on dr testing i do once in 6 months why you do once in 6 months release right your dr is working for this software version now i brought down a node or brought down a data center brought down as az it works that's what you tell rbi you tell that and by the time you tell that one more software change has happened and then you cannot say that you know soft dr was working on that version but now i upgraded to this version right so dr 
is a big pain. Proving that you are you have tested this DR scenarios is a big pain. They don't expect every you know with every build, but at least every three months, every two months, these are the kind of regulations. So use chaos engineering as a to automate these DR scenarios, right? In pre-prod and prod, right? Um, and highly scaled environments, NPCI, UPI payments, we, we do, you know, uh, uh, billions of transactions. So you can't uh, imagine the kind of tech they, there is, they're one of the users of chaos engineering, right? So um, I keep spending a lot of time with them because, you know, it's, it's very difficult to measure what goes wrong where, so you you try to bring down those uh, you know uh, little bit uh, of those resources to make sure that you are reliable, right? And obviously Kubernetes environments because pod deletes happen all the time, right? So Kubernetes chaos engineering, you, you should just do chaos engineering. In fact, I used to recommend whenever you do a test case, right? You you spin up a pod, you bring down a replica. The developer should do that test automatically, right? So if you start doing that, you know, when it gets scaled, uh, all your test cases will become uh, very natural in terms of protecting the reliability. There are a lot of other implementation challenges as well, right? Um, you know, you have to sell, first of all, to your uh, management, why chaos engineering, right? Yeah, I have a lot of problems, reliability. Basically, you're saying that you break more things, right? And that's what it is, but now we are saying that do continuous resilience. Yeah, break things in pre-prod, QA, right? So what's wrong with it? If you are afraid to break things in pre-prod, then definitely you're hiding something, right? And um, it's not easy if you think about it, right? So maturity model, it takes years, which I'll, I'll talk about some of the myths and busts. And um, I need to invest a lot into chaos engineering because somebody needs to write these test cases, fix them, again, continuously improve them, et cetera, et cetera. A new microservice is, uh, you know, introduced, how to make sure that chaos is protected, chaos scenarios are protected for that new service, right? There are a lot of implementation challenges. Um, we are at the beginning of this uh, real chaos engineering cycle. So with that introduction of why what is chaos engineering, we know, and why chaos engineering also, we know, um, right? Primarily, it's uh, Kubernetes, cloud native, developers, and too many moving parts. That's why chaos engineering. Let's talk about some myths and, uh, you know, facts, right? Most of the people say, yeah, I'm doing chaos engineering because, you know, I pull the plug, right? No, that's not chaos engineering. It's much, much more than that. It is about not only pulling plug, but observing almost everything and then doing it as a process, right? And it is about not only bringing uh, something big thing down, but can you introduce API change? What if API does not respond, yeah, right? What if network does not respond? What if the error code comes in a little bit differently while the latency is up? So you need to think of it as like a new design, right? So there should be, my, um, what I tell my teams is, you have a design, you have a test strategy, you should have a chaos test strategy also, right? At the design time, because you're the best person to tell what can go wrong and do you have protection against it in your design, right? And chaos engineering is definitely for SREs, but it is not only for SREs. SREs should do chaos engineering. Chaos engineering should be invested by SRE, VP of SRE, not VP of development, right? So the budgets are usually allocated there, but it's changing, right? So it is for, for the said reasons, you have to put the retaining wall, right? Once it is leaked, it's too costly to fix it. So you have to, you know, um, budget it for QA and developers also. At least I've seen now a lot of QA teams are using chaos, right? Um, because, you know, chaos engineering is started at SRE level and then they don't get permission, right? Okay, let's do it in pre-prod on QA, right? So that's how it's happening, but ideally it should be, you know, um, uh, left to right, not uh, right to left, right? So, uh, 
developers also it will come you know in about a couple of years um, we are doing we are trying to make chaos engineering easy for everyone developers they want everything to be you know very easy through one simple api everything should happen right so write some declarative language chaos just should happen right if you make things easy then they will write test cases along with integration test cases unit test cases can i write uh, chaos test yeah why not make it easy i will use it right so it's evolving it will come in about a year or two uh, you will see there are you know um, examples of people doing it right and chaos engineering is break something and go away that's another problem right it's about 30% breaking 70% observing right if you simply say that um my traffic is still working when i bring down one pod so i'm resilient no it's a false positive right so you try doing that under different conditions under load conditions 100 times you do the same pod delete one time definitely outage will happen so how to get the real value out of chaos engineering is when you put a pod down or delete a pod or a network segment you have to go and observe most of the other parameters what changed by 5% 10% why all right so that means you have a weakness in a particular service to act slow right that is not an outage right now but for a developer it is an outage right what if your sla is that uh, sla is not like a complete outage right so that's where this slis slos come error budgets all the ssres are measuring give me an error budget i can let you go down in the slowness five times in a month right not more than five times that means if you if you become slow more than certain number in a given service you are actually uh, breaching my slo or breaching my sla in terms of business so that has to be treated as an error right error budget i will give you something but not more than that right so if you burn so it's it's about steady state observation right and people think it's yeah you know chaos engineering i have a lot of money for my development teams qa teams chaos engineering people generally say that i don't have budget if you push they'll put they'll ask the same guys to do chaos engineering just add some chaos test no because somebody is pushing me to do chaos test and just add it right that never works right it is an engineering you have to have budget focus and actual um strategy because you know you are spending all this to avoid an outage improve your end customer experience in a big way right so it has to be budgeted this is probably for the leaders in this room or go tell your uh, you know managers that you know you need not buy an enterprise tool but let me um, properly investigate an open source tool and then do it at least my time should be budgeted right so things like that and in chaos engineering is quick no as long as the code is there as long as you are changing it chaos engineering has to continue right it is an extended burden to the sdlc right because you have to be reliable all the time that means you have to continue to change your test cases modify your test cases add your test cases again and again there is no limit to what kind of faults can happen if there are 1000 resources and there are 5000 test cases that you can do right so it's it's a continuous process and that's where we are calling it as continuous resilience right so resilience has to be a continuous effort just like ca cd now cr also is coming right so uh, it, it will come definitely right not only is me who is talking about it recently gartner also uh, looked at it as uh, you know innovation trigger i know mohan doesn't believe in gartner but they talk to people hundreds of people and then see you know what's happening um, they talk to sres yeah you know this is not working we are pushing the qa teams to do the more reliability testing that's the feedback that they give they find a pattern sometimes they influence also but it's happening right so even if it is influence somebody will take that feedback and then you know put it into it so where should you do chaos engineering how are we doing on time 5 minutes okay um infrastructure is first right and then you have to go to memory hogs cpu hogs 
and then you do a lot of APIs, you know, you call some other API of some other cloud to go get authentication done. So what if they respond slow, how to uh, make sure that they're not responding, um, you know, in a very bad way. Even if they do, you should still be reliable. And then application chaos, which is still a kind of a myth, uh, right? So it's not very widely adopted. Uh, how can you go and trigger certain circuit breakers inside your code, right? Like hash if defs are there. So can you actually unlock that hash if def and then test it, right? So put, ask the developer to go put that uh, test case um, inside the code, but it's not built in, but you can trigger it, you know, at that time. So it's failure path testing. So you can go to that level. And then operation chaos is more about when something goes wrong um, and that person is in vacation who is supposed to recover, is it well documented, is it automated? So operational chaos is one of the more, uh, you know, commonly seen uh, in, in whenever you introduce a new service. Things go down, but you don't know how to recover it because only few people know about it, all right? Or the keys are not there. Keys are very secure. So and that person left also. Okay, gone, right? Now after one month I came to know that I need to retrieve that key, right? So a lot of chaos can happen at that time. So start with infrastructure, because if the infrastructure goes down and outage happens because of infrastructure, the impact is very high. And then, you know, keep learning about it and then, you know, keep moving towards uh, that. Operation chaos, for example, is don't tell a person, a very, you know, senior SRE, uh, just ask them to go uh, on leave intentionally for a day and then introduce a major chaos, right, major fault, and then see how the VP of SRE responds, right? So that's the kind of chaos test that you need to do, right? So now the topic is continuous resilience, right? So everything, as developers say, if it's not automated, then it's not done, right? Even chaos testing also has to be automated. I wouldn't recommend automation of chaos in production, right, until, unless you're super clear what you're doing, but I strongly recommend automating chaos in QA and pre-prod environments, right? Um, and then it's continuous resilience is verifying the resilience of your services against faults continuously. It's as simple as that, right? And then you have to do in dev, QA, pre-prod, and prod, right? So prod is, there is a blast radius concept, uh, how much you can take down, right? So you can do 5% increase in CPU on one node in prod. That's chaos. Just see, and, you know, I ran a test case with very little blast radius at a lower traffic uh, time, peak time, yeah, right? So that's, that's okay to do and try to automate it, right? Try to randomize it try to ra randomize multiple things in that low blast radius things. But you have to know what you're doing because, you know, customer experience can be very bad if you are injecting a fault, you know, uh, willfully and the blast radius is very high. And especially in production, you have to have auto remediation uh, built in because you are introducing fault. If something doesn't recover, uh, the test case should recur recovery also. Right, the tool can do, uh, right, depending on the tool, depending on who's writing the test case. So you just have to be careful. But try to be not so careful in pre-prod. Let somebody suffer, right? So let's see, you know, who is at fault? A developer design issue comes in, operational issue comes in. But being too reckless will bring down your entire uh, productivity of QA teams. That's also very dangerous. So just try to be a little bit aggressive, right? So metrics I talked about, the common metrics is mean time to fail, mean time to repair or recover, mean time to inject a failure, right? How fast you can reproduce an outage, right? These are the common SRA practices or metrics. The new ones that I've been recommending is resilience score and resilience coverage. This is mostly for targeted towards developers and QA. How much of coverage have you done? Yeah, all code is done. White box testing, black box testing. No, I'm talking about resilience, chaos test, right? Have you covered all faults in all areas, right? So that's resilience coverage. I, my services are resilient against 10 test cases. That's good. 
you know, another thousand are there, but at least you know this 10 test cases, you're resilient. That is the metric, right? And that's the way to ask for budget also. Let's say another incident happened, uh, outage happened, you can say that only this 10 I've covered. And that incident falls into some other area, so give me a budget to go and implement that test case, right? So resilience score is how well are you doing uh, against a given fault, or how well a service is doing against multiple faults happening into it, right? So these are just, it's all common sense, nothing new, right? So think about uh, these metrics. So again, if you are deep into chaos engineering, if you ask somebody, what are you doing? We are running game days. That's ad hoc chaos engineering. Trying to do continuously, educating people why, what, how, right? And doing it with a purpose, with a strategy, uh, with some budget is called continuous resilience, right? So you do it like engineering, then reliability will improve, right? So how fast it takes, right? If you do it super fast with high budget, it takes three years to get to expert level, okay? If you just casually start doing it and you are responding, you know, your business is doing well, then automatically some support will come. But you always start with a test and then slightly try to automate whatever you've done and then try to encourage other team members to do that same automation. Then expert level is, you know, 80% of your services are um, under chaos testing in non-prod and 20% is in prod automated testing and in non-prod things are randomized. That's like, you know, you're very, very comfortable. Look back three, four years ago, you had no test case. Now, you know, there's a lot of design changes that uh, have been forced because of this chaos testing. So you are doing at a much, um, the ROI will be very, very high. And you help your business to scale also faster. Now, what's the point of, you know, come on, bring another thousand users onto the same thing, no problem. Because I've tested it, right? It can take load. Without this kind of data, people over-provision services, right? I don't know, better tell, no, it's not my problem, my boss, let him put another $100,000 into another big set of racks and other things. Yeah, you know, I don't want to uh, run my service more than 50% of the load, right? You don't need to do that, right? If you're confident of if something goes down, it can still go to 80%. And then worked well. That kind of a testing, if you are done, you are very confident, so you can optimize your cost. So chaos engineering is is a must, right? If you are a good developer, good SRE, good leader, um, you have to look at it pro proactively, and definitely it gives good returns. You know, um, once you start implementing it, that's the way to take care of reliability. That's the summary of it, and then open source. You have Litmus and other tools. It's a good project. I can watch for it. I wrote it, right? Um, you also have Enterprise Edition um, through Harness. So that's also now pretty stable, widely deployed. So if you're a business or a developer, you have choices to take control on, on reliability. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Uma, for the any questions, uh, maybe you can feel free to ask. Sorry, it took more time. It's 11.30. So. Chaos Monkey is just one of the tools, right? Um, there are many other tools. Chaos Monkey was started by Netflix. They did good marketing. Almost everybody thinks chaos engineering means chaos monkey. Thanks to them, they actually, you know, marketed the word through that. But Chaos Monkey, I don't want to say bad tool or good tool, it's a tool. And um, I started with Chaos Monkey and I wanted to, you know, being a developer, do something very cloud native, right, with containers. So that's where Litmus was written. Chaos Mesh is another one, Chaos Blade. There are three uh, Chaos projects within CNCF. But if you want to do a modern chaos engineering, you know, pick up Kubernetes related tools and they will help. And um, if you are an enterprise, at some point you want to see if there are enterprise options also, right? 
So then, you know, it's better to pick something like Litmus because, you know, you really want to invest a lot and get a good ROI. There are enterprise tools support available, right? So. Yes, now you can. Um, there are a lot of chaos engineers out there. Um, but it's, it's not that difficult. Um, Chaos engineers, I mean, with tools like Litmus and four years ago, chaos engineering, even if I want to do, I have to hire somebody, you know, specific to uh, that field because, you know, it's not that common knowledge. But now the tools have evolved. Things are easy. We provide a SaaS service. So you can just, you know, plug in and then, you know, start doing your chaos just within five minutes. So, and also it has to be done by developers eventually. So it's a skill. Um, you can write, you can ask somebody in your team to write uh, 10 test cases, but you want thousands of test cases. Really, right? So who will write them? It's like whoever is writing the regular test cases, they have to write. But definitely you need a champion. So chaos engineering, you can pick a QA lead, ask them to read about chaos engineering, right? You know, um, just um, motivate them or give some benefits, uh, right, goals, then they can pick it up. Yeah, but there are new roles called chaos engineers. I've seen in job portals, we are looking for a chaos engineer. Okay, then I tweet that, look, chaos engineering is important, so. Thanks a lot, uh, thanks for the question as well. Thank you. Uh, yeah, config chaos, data chaos, yes. I would not recommend you to do data chaos unless you know what you're doing. Config chaos, um, is also a resource chaos, right? So config chaos is the first thing that you do. Um, change the number of replicas, scale down, right? How do you do the, either you can change the config to bring down the replicas or you can just delete one uh, replica and see if it comes hap happens or not. So the tools provide various options. Mostly they are at an infrastructure level or a config level. Right? Data chaos is also there. For example, our enterprise version supports file system chaos. So go and while the data is being written, put some corrupted data. See whether the database has redundancy in that or not. Right? You can do that, but then eventually, you know, if you are screwing up some complaints, problems, uh, and not only you, your CAO also will be in trouble. Right? So you have to be very careful. Don't do it in production, but you can definitely do it in non-prod, all right? So try to corrupt a database in non-prod. See what happens, right? So do you have operational uh, readiness to recover it or not, right? Who knows? On that kind of challenges you can recover. But definitely that's expert level. Hi, sir. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, so is there any books uh, do you recommend on chaos engineering? docs.litmuschaos.io. <laughs> That's the latest book. Don't read any other books here. I've been asked all the time, write, write. Should I write a book or should I write something new in the code and docs, then they can read. We are in open source world, right? So just go and read. Um, you, you come to Chaos Community, you know, we help you read. It's all so easy. We'll help you learn, right? associate with the community. This is all happening because of community, right? So that's the fastest way. Don't read books. Let's get something done with code, right? Oh, thanks. So. Hi, sir. Here. So my question is uh, here. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> this is Karthik from Presidio. I have one question, sir. Uh, is a chaos engineering uh, is for uh, saying the like code level. I'm just looking about the infrastructure. Is in chaos and uh, disaster recovery is and dependable or so? Yes, as I said, chaos engineering has to be done at the first infrastructure level only, right? So then you can go to the code level in the end. But you have to start with infrastructure chaos only first. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Is that your question? Sorry. I so it's a DR is dependable for chaos, right? Sorry? Disaster recovery is a dependable for chaos engineering. Yes, that's one of the use cases. So disaster recovery or DR scenario can be kick-started in various ways. 
you can go and bring down some infrastructure to kickstart a DR scenario. So DR is one of the definite use cases for chaos engineering to automate DR testing. Thank you, sir. Read a lot. I strongly recommend not to ignore this, right? If at all it's not possible to implement, it's a good topic for you Hello. to learn and, you know. Is it uh, working? Hi, sir. Uh, there are a couple of questions. One, uh, like in the automotive world, uh, they got a global end cap after you've done a quality checks, right? Likewise, uh, for the Kaios engineering, when you sell your product on the marketing, how you differentiate that? Is there any kind of tagging attached with the software? Um, generally, yeah, I mean, we are not gone to that level. Have your, has your product gone through chaos testing? You should ask them before buying, yeah, right? I mean, is there any kind of rating um, for the Kaios engineering such that your product got a higher preference to the, your competitor? See, it's all tied to reliability, right? So how resilient you are, people always market. We are the highest resilient, reliable product. But chaos engineering is a way to achieve that, right? So I hope uh, I could give a better answer, but we are not there yet. I wish that is true, right? So buy this product because it is chaos engineering certified. If it is that, then, you know, buy it, right? So something like that. And then the follow-up was Quias engineering is something uh, which will always come at the end of the software development or in this permit, or it should be part of the design principle itself. It's the later. Uh, we have something called chaos first principle that I've been advocating. Chaos should not be done at the last. Chaos should be done at the first. As soon as the developer writes code, they have to write a test case, functional test case, failure test case, performance test case, and also chaos test case, right? Chaos testing should be added as a strategy for your design document done by QA uh, engineers, right? Because if you take control of chaos at that level, right, um, you will unearth problems early enough and your leaders will see the value. Uh, they encourage you to do it. Uh, they encourage you to automate it. Definitely our recommendation is do it at the beginning. That's where continuous resilience as a topic is coming. People are saying, yes, you know, I think it, it makes sense to do it, right? So, yeah, it should be at the beginning. It's uh, then, yeah, left to right. Any, any key or maybe um, good advice uh, to convince management? Because currently I'm in telecom world. Uh, it's always tough to get a pre-prod environment equivalent to that of the prod environment because a lot of cost, infrastructure, everything is yeah. involved in it. That is another myth. You don't need an equivalent environment to do the same, um, to reproduce the same outage. Whenever an outage has happened, there is an RCA, right? What happened? Um, because of what? Because some network slowness happened, something else changed in the code and that did not respond or some configuration was a problem and hence the outage has happened. Take the RCA and try to reproduce that symptoms at lower environment only by using various diff different test cases. Load need not be by putting thousands of users. When you put thousands of users, the CPU goes high, the database utilization goes high. You can simulate those conditions using chaos test. And then when that goes high, somebody did not do the job well. So now you can write the test case like that. Um, so with chaos, with the lower environments, you can still uh, reproduce production faults. That's, that's a fact. That's possible with modern chaos tools. Right? So try to sell that. There's a lot of uh, new knowledge available. And then a lot of um, uh, research reports are saying chaos engineering is a need. Right? So you can try to sell that. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, guys. I would like to invite Mani on the stage. Thank you, thank you, Uma, for that. Okay, all right. Thank you all. Uh, we have a couple of announcements. So Zoho had set up a stall outside at the reception lobby. So you can collect your raffle coupon there, and uh, you'll be getting the results of the raffle at the end of the day. So you can go ahead for that. Uh, we'll be breaking now for 15 minutes. Uh, 
quickly and we'll be back uh, by 11.55. Thank you.